Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Hello there, sorry to interrupt. I wanted to let you know that you can now join our supporting cast over on Patreon. As thanks for your support, you'll be able to help us pick films, submit questions for guests, have first pick on brand new and exclusive merch, and much more. Thank you for your support. Now back to the show. Hello, welcome back to Fighting on Film. Now we're recording this episode on Halloween, but if last week's film was a shocker, this week's is anything but. Chosen by our faithful Patreon supporters, it's Bat 21, which has a Halloween thing in the title. We got there in the end, Matt. Yeah. We linked it in. Yeah. Yeah. We did it. We did it. So, um, yeah, thanks to our patrons for choosing this one. I know that there's been some um, some patrons. There's been clamour for this for a while, and we yeah. we, get, we we put three Vietnam movies up, and then uh, Narvik, the recent film, as a as a, uh, a wild card, mm. and um, it was almost won. Actually, it was almost a draw, um, but yes. then Bat Twenty One pulled ahead. Forty five percent of the vote, I think. Um, which was, you know, nearly half. Good um, But yeah, do look out for another Patreon pit coming later on in the month. Um, Matt, maybe you should do production and then we'll get into cast. Absolutely. So the film was uh, directed by Peter Markle. Um, and in terms of kind of uh, conflict related films, he did Faith of My Fathers in 2005, which was a John McCain biopic. Nice. Um, it tells the story of um, his experience during the military being shot down over Vietnam um, and uh, his, his imprisonment and then release. Um, in 2006, he uh, directed Flight 93. And in between then, he he did a lot of TV work, CSI, X-Files, all sorts of different things. Uh, the film was produced by Vision uh, PDG and Eagle Films. Um, it was written by William C. Anderson, who himself was a U.S. Um, Air Force uh, officer. Uh, running from uh, the Second World War through to Vietnam, and nice. he retired as a colonel. And he wrote the book about the uh, the uh, rescue attempts and uh, Bat Twenty One in general, and then he uh, ad- helped adapt the screenplay. Um, he also wrote an episode of Twelve O'clock High in nineteen seventy five, uh, and he worked on the screenplay um, with George Gordon, uh, who was a prolific animator and director of uh, animated programs uh, including the smurfs toon heads new scooby-doo casper and uh, in 1943 he was also an animator on uh, mouse at war which was a tom and jerry um Ooh. it's like short what which very nice and tom and jerry um basically fighting world war ii in a basement mm. um i have seen I wish it, were, it yeah i wish there were more animated war films there aren't many I know we need. There's no. a few, and we need to do a few of them. I, I think. Wolves with we're, Bashir we're is good. That's a good one. Mm. Mm. Um, there's definitely a couple that we, you know, we could definitely do an animated month. We could, but, we could eke it out. Yeah, if we did Dirty Does in December, we could definitely. <laughs> yeah, anything. Definitely possible. do it. <laughs> um, uh, music was by Christopher Young, and cinematography was provided by Mark Erwin, and. He's known for uh, RoboCop 2, uh, Scream, the original Scream film. He was also the cinematographer on Flight 93, uh, which was obviously directed by Markle. Um, In 2006, he also uh, provided cinematography for Big Mama's House 2. Amazing. Yep. And in 1992, he he worked on Passenger 57, which I believe uh, is uh, another one of those classic 90s hijack movies. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Um, there definitely was. We, we were talking about this the other day, uh, mm. How just how many plane hijack movies there were in the 90s. And then another notable credit was the uh, the TV movie Hanoi Hilton in 1987. Oh, yes. Um, sp- uh, special effects was provided by Richard E. Johnson, and costume design was by Audrey M. Bansmer, um, who worked on Delta Force 2, The Columbian Connection, uh, Avenging Force, American Warrior, uh, American Ninja Two and the TV show Frasier. Great! What a what a brilliant career trajectory. Topical. Going from going from 
American Warrior to uh, Frasier. Nice. Yeah, yeah. And um, interestingly, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Aseel Hamilton, uh, who the film is about, it's Bat 21 himself, um, was the technical advisor on the film. And well, I think good. that's interesting. And we'll talk about that a bit later on, I think. In terms of locations, it was actually filmed in Malaysia, uh, in Borneo, uh, with the assistance of the the federal government of Malaysia and their armed forces. So a lot of the you know the big kit on screen that you see uh, was provided by the uh, Malaysian Royal Army and uh, Royal Air Force. Yeah, it was. More on that later. Mm. Um, and the the film's budget was uh, a healthy ten million, um, but the return wasn't great. Which is a bit of a surprise, really. Mm. With um, I think uh, the budget was ten million and the return was three point one million. So it definitely didn't make Yeesh. its money back in theaters. A, it might have done on home release, etc. Yeah, but possibly in that era you could. Yeah, you really it, could clean up with VHS. It sales. Definitely surprised me because it's in that period, isn't it, of a raft of good yeah. Vietnam War movies and even good B Vietnam War movies. Yeah. And Hackman's coming um, off of Uncommon Valor as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm, interesting. So that basically rounds out um, production for this week. Oh, nice one. That's good. So some good stuff there, Matt. Um, so into cast, and then we'll do retro review and the one word reviews. So aforementioned, Gene Hackman plays Lieutenant Colonel I. Seal Hamilton. Uh, you know, Hackman, as we mentioned on the pod before, when we did on Common Valley, is a two-time Oscar winner. You'll know him from The French Connection, The Conversation, which is a fantastic movie. Um, as I said on Common Valor, Under Fire, he saw Sabowski in A Bridge Too Far, and he was in March or Die and Behind Enemy Lines and, and countless other things. You know, massive, massive actor. Um, then we have Danny Glover, who I think is making his debut on the uh, pod as Captain Bartholomew Clark, um, codenamed Bird Dog. Uh, he's a four-time Emmy nominee, probably best known for his role as Murtaugh in the Lethal Weapon franchise. Um, you know, famously coined the phrase, I'm too old for this shit. Um, mm-hmm. And he also appeared in Predator 2. He's in Flight of the Intruder, Operation Dumbo Drop, which is another Vietnam War film. We must cover, Matt. We yeah, must. Because I, um, I actually quite like that film. Um, he was in a TV film called Buffalo Soldiers, which is an American Civil War film. And he was also in a, a Wes Anderson film called The Royal Tenenbaums, which I'm sure Matt he knows was. all about because he's a... Along he's with a, Gene. Along with Gene, yes, of course. Yes. How could I have missed that out? Um, Matt is our resident uh, Wes Anderson file. He's a, a big fan. Um, so am I, actually, to be fair. Anyway, uh, next we have Jerry Reed as Colonel George Walker. He's a famous country singer turned actor. He played uh, Cletus, sorry, he played Cletus in Smokey and the Bandit in its sequel, um, and he was in Waterboy, uh, and he also appeared as himself in Scooby-Doo in the 70s. Um, well, I wonder if uh, that was animated by uh, by um, uh, George Gordon. Very may well have been. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Reggie, Reg- I'm going to go do a Vietnam <laughs> movie, Reggie. <Reg>. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Then we have David Marshall Grant playing Ross Carver. He's the Jolly Green pilot. He wears a red headband in the movie. Um, He was in Kent State, a TV movie. Um, He was in Dallas, the early years, uh, forever young. He was in The Rock in in an uncredited role. He's also in Dawson's Creek and uh, one of my personal favourites, The Devil Wears Prada. He's in that one. Um, I do love that film. Um, He's uh, Clayton Rona. He's up, sorry. Clayton Rona is up next. He plays Sergeant Harley Rumbar. Um, he was in a plethora of, you know, well-known American TV shows. Uh, Miami Vice, uh, Beverly Hills 90210, NYPD Blue, The X-Files, ER, and Justified. And he also appeared in Depeche Mode's uh, music video for their single, Not Tonight, which I thought was a nice little inclusion. Um, then we have Eric Anderson as Major Jake Scott. Um, he's in Friday the 13th, the final chapter. He was in Missing in Action, the um, Chuck Norris movie. Um, oh. Murder, She Wrote, Dallas, Quantum Leap, Matlock, and Jag, which is like that naval uh, like mm-hmm. sort of core yeah. procedural drama. Um, then we have, finally, rounding out the cast, because it's quite a lean cast. There's not many people at play in the movie. Um, and I think the movie works. It's all the better for it because of that. 
um, yeah, doesn't muddle itself with side characters or, or B plots. Um, you have Joe Dorsey as Colonel Douglas, uh, yet again, another prolific TV actor and film actor. Um, he's been in War Games, um, Roots, The Incredible Hulk, Hill Street Blues, and a TV film that's three and a bit hours long, which sounds really interesting, called Guts and Glory The Rise and Fall of Oliver North, which Ooh, I'm, I'm sure okay. has everything from Contras to CBS News in it. So that would be quite interesting. Wow. Yeah, just reminds me of the American Dad song. It's like, he's a novelist and a patriot, and now he's on Fox News. It just reminds me of that. Holy North. Love it. Anyway, <laughs> moving on to the retro review this week. Um, joining us again for the retro review is good old Roger Ebert um, from the date of the film's release in October. Do you the think 20- there was any film that Roger didn't watch back in the day? Probably not. No, he was prolific. No. I I reckon he had very little time for anything else. No, because I I love Cisco Lee, but I used to watch. Roger, like, do you want to we were... come play tennis on Thursday? No, I can't possibly do that. I'm watching eight films. I'm watching a film. Me, me and Siskel have got loads of films to watch. We've got eight films to do on that morning alone. I I I'd love to, but no. No, exactly. No, I I do watch the old rerun of of uh, Siskel and Ebert on YouTube. It's just They're very watchable. So great, so great. They're like um, you know, like the trip. Rob Bride and Steve Coogan. They're like oh, that, yeah. but for movies for me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love a biopic about them. It'd be, it'd be so good. Um, have oh, you God, seen the... there's, a, there's a Netflix movie in that, oh, isn't, there is, really? isn't there? There is, yeah. Um, oh, you know who might play him well, actually? Um, Jonah Hill. Oh, okay. Hmm. Jonah Hill might do either if he bulked up again. It might be cool. <laughs> anyway, so on to the retro review. I've got a couple of paragraphs uh, this week. Bat 21 is the kind of lean, no-nonsense war film Hollywood used to make back before the subject became burdened with metaphysical insights. It's a story of a middle-aged Air Force colonel's attempt to survive behind enemy lines, where he has no business being in the first place, and about how stubborn spotter pilot returns time and time again in a light aircraft to keep his spirits up. The movie could have been about any modern war, and in Gene Hackman it has its everyman. Hamilton isn't a fighting man, but a desk officer who takes a cup of coffee along on his foolhardy mission and is sipping it when the missiles strike his airplane. He has no combat experience, has never gotten close to the front lines, and is horrified by his encounter with the Vietnamese family that leads him to kill for the first time. This is not a combat movie, but the story of a man who spent almost his entire career keeping war at arm's length until it reached out and grabbed him. Gene was pushing some buttons when the missile hit, to be fair <laughs> yeah, to him. Gene was he doing put a his bit flask more away. sipping some coffee, um, like. You know. But yeah. Not like Hamilton hadn't been in the US Navy Air Force, the US Air Force for decades at that point. Yeah. Um, and yeah, he recently flew, just done all Korea. the escape and evasion. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Forces yeah. again, by, by all accounts. Um, so, but yes. Ebert, I, Ebert I mean, needs we'll talk... to read up on his Vietnam War history there, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but to be fair... We'll talk about it later on as well, but I I did like the fact that um that my my point has just completely just left my mind. That's <laughs> it's just in. fucking gone. It's just Matt's brain just went. You know, like in a, in a in a cartoon where like the thought brain just leaves the little like head. <laughs> just left oh my you. god, it'll come back to me because it it'll was, come it back. Was a fair point. We'll be halfway through um, the yeah, alley, Teddy, going. On. Matt, go. It was this. <laughs> it will. That will happen, guaranteed. So on to the one word reviews there in light of Matt's <laughs> lightheadedness, shall we say. Um, so the movie, I think, is beloved by nearly everyone who commented on the one word review thread this week. And there was, you know, a massive outpour of, of love. So Rob Shipman, we must shout out, he's one of our patrons and he's been gunning for Bat 21 since the inception of the podcast, I might add. Yeah. Um See, so I mean, I'm... don't let anyone say that if you join our Patreon, we will eventually do a film that you can continue to ask for. <laughs> exactly. I mean, we're, we're not that kind of we're not that kind of podcast, but it has happened. It happens. You know, finally. There's hope, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so Rob Shipman simply goes. Shipman goes simply with legendary. Ian McKellen goes Hackman, and he puts a smiling emoji. Um, Lance Nielsen goes with gripping. Conrad Radders goes with golfers. Uh, Seri Thomas says Sky Raider. Uh, the Sloppy Link goes with Gulf. Jim Dudaku says Solid. Ian Mays, Interesting. Dr. Stephen uh, Marushin goes with Over Par. Stephen Me- Steve Metcalf says Gene Tastic. D. 
Digging Robat, Sam, Mark C, Bronco, Rob Nickel, Bird Dog, Jeff Power says Minefield, and to round us up, uh, Craig Seaton says Cessna. But there was many, many, many more. Um, and I think this movie is, as I said, just really well liked by everyone who's seen it, I think. Yeah. And I think that has something to do with what um Ebert's review kind of captured as well, in that it it is a straightforward picture. There is no yeah. it's lean B plot. There is no um messing around with no. um sort of trying to show different perspectives. There's no baddie. It's no, just, there isn't really. It's yeah. just the Vietnamese and the hell of war. That is the yeah. they are the the antagonist. Or the cluster, or the, um, well, really the clusterfuck of the Easter offensive when you know the MVA got their shit together and started pushing. Finally, yeah. you know when when the US pulled out effectively. Um, Indeed, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. I've got it in my notes um, that the, the the plot starts. You know, Gene Hackman gets blown up and is parachuting down at seven minutes 30. That's how quick the movie gets into it. You see Hackman yeah. playing golf. He gets himself involved in that Sam jamming mission. Mm-hmm. Sam jamming sounds like a band or nice. an album name. Nice. It's Sam jamming the sound of the summer, 1972. Um, and then you're into the, you're into the plot. It's, I loved how quick it was. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's very straightforward. It, I, it almost has a sort of uh, TV movie approach to it in that it is it does fast. It goes straight into it and it's really well paced. Um, mm. But again, that's kind of final thoughts territory. But Off we'll the top come back of my to head, it. I can't remember the name of the production company. Is it Orion? Who like made all of like the, who made like Delta Force and made Robocop. They did that mercenary movie we did in Freedom mm. Fighters film. You know how quickly they get into things? Yeah. There's no fucking about. You're just in. Like this yeah, is what yeah, the movie's yeah. about. Mm. You know, get get used to it, kind of thing. It's how it feels. Yeah. Mm. And it's it's a straightforwardness that does hark back, but is also present in you know American filmmaking of yeah. that period. Um, to compare it to an, a, another Vietnam movie of, of the same sort of ilk, Siege of Firebase Gloria gets into yeah. it quick. That doesn't mess about, Ooh. does it? Mm. They're at the firebase, blooming quick in that. Yeah, and mm. it's, it, it. And to be fair to the film, I think this might be the point I was going to make earlier, where Roger talks about it doesn't. Um, I, I can't remember exactly what he said, but he he, he talks about it not being metaphysical and and yes. looking at philosophy. I I don't know. I think the film is has a very anti-war streak through it, with, yeah. uh, with Hackman's character coming into contact with what the air force is doing on the ground on the gr- you yeah. know and he's, he's encountering it on the ground necessarily there's batty a number it. of ways it does it really well yeah. because not only is he is he seeing um indiscriminate death from you know striking the, the village but also there's there's more nuanced stuff like the 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 vietnamese uh, farmer's son has a horrific burn from probably a, a napalm strike or something yeah, similar. Yeah, subtle things. It doesn't bat it over the head. Mm. You know, Gene doesn't look at him and go, oh, you poor thing. What have my helicopters done to you? Like, he doesn't, you know, a lesser yeah. a lesser writer would have worked that in somehow. Like, what are we mm-hmm. doing to these people? Like, you don't, you don't really get it. I think Hackman has one line where he goes, I've seen enough death or something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, which is well, He decides which is fine. not to shoot the... Uh... The MVA soldier yeah. the, towards the end, um, you know, then gets obliterated gets anyway. by a napalm. Yeah. But he Blood makes explosion. the conscious decision not to, mm. to shoot him himself, mm. um, and you, you can see that mind that mindset evolve throughout the film, which I really liked. But again, it's time for the alley tally. It's time for alley tally on fighting on film. Yes, the alley tally back again. So, Matt, why don't you kick us off? I I kicked off last week. Why don't you? Oh, yeah, alley shout Italian. out to Gene Hackman's character's excellent choice in pistol, Browning High. Yeah, Park. I thought you were going to say that. Love it. Perfect. Thirteen round magazine, nine millimeter, lighter than a nineteen eleven. Perfect flight vest, sort of sidearm. Love it. We love a Browning High Power on the show, don't yeah. we? 
Very yeah. cool, cool. So much so that Matt's been trying to buy an airsoft replica for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and at the time of recording, no supplier in the UK has the version <laughs> he wants. Oh, uh, yeah, it's true. I like that Gene and Danny both use a very um, OG M16, probably a Colt SP1. Um, yeah, that's nice. With the three prong flash hider and no forward assist. Um, that's been probably sat in the back of Danny's helicopter since 1966, I would guess. Probably. <laughs> Crew weapon, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, just, I, I liked the film, but it, there isn't a lot of meat on the bones. And no. that, that's a good thing, but also it means there's not a lot of alley kit, but there's a lot of alley aircraft. Yeah, I mean, I know. So in terms of aircraft, I mean, we've got a whole bunch, like, and they're supplied by, as Matt said, the Royal Malaysian Air Force. You have Sikorsky SH-3C Kings, which are, uh, you know, the, the Jolly Greens, uh, a Cessna 337A Super Skymaster that's acting as a, a military uh, 02 Skymaster, which replaced, it, yeah. which replaced the Cessna 01 Bird Dog, which I thought might have been a reference Um Maybe to that, maybe yeah, to Clark lent, lent on the uh, yeah. the other ones. I like to think in my head, Canon Clark was like a master at flying the bird dogs, and it just kind of stuck. Um, Clearly, cause... I mean, he he talks about himself being the oldest captain in the air force, which I liked. Yeah, because I love he's it. like ten years too old for the um, for the role anyway. Because yeah, it's like thirty five. Was supposed to be. Um, he's definitely too old for this shit. Yeah, man. I expect. I, I don't know if they didn't. It's, it's in it. It's too early for that line, isn't it? Isn't that too line early? Yeah, like, it's a couple of years two. later. I think. So my early pick this week is Hamilton's Vest Survival Type SRU Twenty One, which is, yes. uh, in layman's terms, a aircrewman survival vest. Which houses um, that great high power? Yeah. So um, it's a nylon gilet style vest with multiple pouches and a, hol- a holster sewn into the left, which you do see in use. Um, and I think it's possibly one of the few on-screen depictions of its use in Vietnam. And they're quite prevalent in air crews and, um, you know, uh, air crew personnel, war them in Vietnam and beyond. And I just love to see its use. Um, you know, Hackman's got all sorts of gadgets and doodads in there, I'm sure. But he uses predominantly a little spotting scope yeah. um, to see got like things. a strobe as well and a compass yeah. and some, some uh, charts and stuff. Mm, I just love to see it. It was a really nice little thing. Um, it shows, you know, that they don't just drop in naked you know i like the fact that yeah. something the thought's gone yeah. into it um because i'm sure hamilton you know in, in the real in the real rescue i'm sure it was worth its weight in gold with all the knickknacks it had in it um so and i also really like danny glover's atlanta braves baseball cap and t-shirt because i think it just really humanizes no i know i know i like it because it's like a bit of americana and different different sort of costuming but i think it really grounds his character in a way and it really humanizes him like he's got yeah. a whole life back home, you know. It's it's just really nice. Um, mm-hmm. I thought it might have been a nod to like Danny Glover's like childhood home or something, but he grew up in San Francisco, so who's to know? Obviously, um, just crafted it for the character, I guess. Yeah, I like it. It's really nice. Or he's a fan, or maybe he's a fan. Yeah, who knows? Um, and then, uh, as I said, you know, as Matt said, because it, it's quite lean. There's not much in there in the way of kit and equipment, but you know, you've got mainstays of Vietnam films, you've got an M16 in there, as Matt said, an M60, there's flat jackets, like you know, proper yeah. typical NVA NBA with uh, captured M2 Brownings. Yeah, I like that. All the MVA lads are knocking around with um, you know, uh, captured American belts lots, and things like that. Lots of Chinese type 56 spiker AKs. Yeah, very nice to see. Very um, nice to see. A Makarov's in there too. Gets yes, drawn at one point, which is quite yeah. nice. Um, and then uh, going back to aircraft, there's there's Northrop F5s and uh, Super Sabres that provide air support. Um, and I think those Super Sabres must have been stock footage. I'm not sure if the Malaysian Art, uh, Air Force had them. Yeah, I don't know, because they were marked no. up as US Air Force, weren't they? So, yeah, exactly. Not sure. And in terms of um, uh, vehicles, there isn't much on the ground. And I, it took me, did some digging, so don't quote me on this. So I think the bombing run vehicles are, because you know, mm. I'm a truck guy for some reason, I just like trucks, um, which is weird because I don't really <laughs> like vehicles. I don't really like cars in real life. I can't <laughs> give a toss about cars. Um, so I think they're possibly Volvo FL7s 
or Isuzu FTS 33H trucks. They were both used by the Malaysian army mm. in the 80s. So they might be that. Um, and God knows what those tanks were because they were so well camouflaged. I couldn't work oh, out what yeah, they were. Oh, yeah, I know. It was a bit tricky, wasn't it? I think the the Malaysian um, APCs, I don't know what they used at the time, but yeah, they, they definitely weren't BMPs or anything. No, they weren't. They were a bit, were they? They weren't. Um, but no, there's some, it's, some, it's enough, isn't it? It does enough um, to to set the scene. Um, but I think uh, maybe we should talk about the real rescue a little bit. So the movie's based upon the real 12-day rescue of Hamilton in 1972, and he was shot down during the, the North Vietnamese Easter Offensive. Um, the film doesn't show, however, the efforts of US Navy SEAL Thomas R. Norris and his South Vietnamese petty officer Nguyen Van Kiet. Mm. Um who uh, rescued Hamilton in the end because this this rescue was enormous it was one of the most you know in-depth expensive rescues ever and it uh, a lot of people have asked the question you know what price do you put on a human life and this showed that the air force puts no price on getting one of their men out considering he was you know an expert in the jamming of sams he's quite a high price target and you don't want yeah, someone like absolutely. that falling into mva hands especially not in a time where the where the Americans are drawing down their uh, combat operations in Vietnam, anyway, um, so yeah, um, Norris and and Kiet uh, went in uh, dressed as uh, uh, North Vietnamese fishermen, um, and they got him out, and by putting him under um, reeds, bamboo reeds, and things in a boat, and they ushered him out, I and mean, it was one of the final. Um, seal actions of the war and Norris won a medal of honor for his efforts and uh, Kiet won a uh, Navy cross, which is the highest naval award yeah. Um, yeah. that can be awarded to a foreign national. So it's a film about those guys, please. Um, Cause at the time um, it wasn't classified. Um, so it's, that's why it's not in there. It was classified. Yeah. It was, sorry. It was at the time. It was yeah, classified. Yeah. I know yeah. what you mean. Just, yeah. 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 But no, it's but fascinating. It, it is, and, I, and at the end of the film's okay, but I think introducing another character would have confused. They rush it. Things, a you know, introducing a Navy SEAL character would have confused things a bit. I think I and wouldn't have minded that. No, I, I mean, they, there's a way of doing it. that, isn't there? Yeah, there's a way of, yeah. of having that. Um, it's worth noting that five additional aircraft were shot down during yes. the rescue attempts, and eleven um, uh, airmen were killed. Uh, yeah. during rescue efforts which is kind of depicted with when the jolly green uh, gets uh, downed and the crew yeah, they, is killed. Sort of, they do it in their own way don't they um in 97 six of the bodies were interned at arlington uh, oh, wow. um of of the of the 11 um so i think the film does a, a fairly decent job of trying to show some of the um the price the cost of, of rescuing yes. hamilton um, but obviously, it's difficult to convey that kind of scale of operation with mm. the budget they had. Yeah, I think so. Um, and also, one thing they don't do in the movie, which which I thought was fascinating when I was reading about it, and what was great documentaries on YouTube, guys, if you there want is, to learn more about the Genuine too. Rescue. Um, me and Matt have been sending them to each other all this week um, as we prepared um, for this episode, because we were just like, I hope it's about 21, because <laughs> we really wanted to watch it. <laughs> um but there was no fire zone implemented around how there was a no fire zone implemented around Hamilton um, during the real rescue. Something that isn't depicted in the movie, you know, there's bombs going off all around him all the time. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Arvin units sustained some pretty di like big losses and casualties during the rescue because they couldn't call in fire support because um, they were around the area of, of Hamilton's rescue. And I've read somewhere and, and some people think, well, the Easter offensive got off to a good start because there were elements of the line that couldn't be held because there was no air support and there was no fire support being brought in. I don't know how much that would have affected the Easter offensive because just the amount of kit and equipment and men that were pushing it like through was enormous. Um, so I'm not sure, but in terms of cost and logistical elements, things like that, I'm pretty sure it must have fed in its own way into the offensive doing really rather well and you know as we know that offensive was you know it won the war for the <laughs> north vietnam um essentially but it just incredible stuff you know i there's, an, there's there's another movie in this is essentially what i'm getting at 
in terms of things that yeah happen. yeah you could you could totally make um a, a new movie or even a mini series about mm. um you know, the escape and invasion every day <laughs> you cool. know the escape and invasion um the the seals efforts uh and and the, the you know give a bit of perspective from the vietnamese as well would be good would be good because norris went in and he had a lot of um uh south vietnamese um commandos effectively of south vietnamese seals with him who at one point refused to go further um and it was uh it was kiet that volunteered to go in um, some sort of incredibly brave people you know and even to get a not a, a seals vietnam movie would be great yeah um and it's interesting really cool. it's late war too i mean there's yeah, so many vietnam explored. war movies that don't touch Mm -mm. 70 onwards no as i think everyone forgets i think people think i think in the grand learning of norm i think you think 68 you think Tet mm -hmm. offensive and then it's pretty much saigon in 75 you know i think it doesn't i think that gap is a big gap in terms of mm movies and, and cultural touchstones you know you get kent state in 1970 obviously uh back home but in terms of the war going on i think it gets lost yeah and the way that the war is characterized in a lot of films 1969 is often depicted as being late war where mm. in reality it you know it's another few years there were still chaps on the ground in 73 yeah um I think that brings us to favourite scenes. I think it does. So I'll, I'll kick off favourite scenes, if that's okay. Go for it. So I really enjoy... Um, so, as I said, uh, 7 minutes 30 is when the, the plot kicks in of Hamilton being shot down. Mm. And I really like the initial scene of Hackman hitting the ground and Clark responding to the rescue. Because as... As we've mentioned before, you know, the film wastes no time getting into that central part plot. And then you you just see the bond created between the ground and the air, Clark and Hamilton. Um, and you, you've got Clark saying, I'm the lifeguard. You're the drowning man. If you relax, I can bring you to shore. If you resist, I'll have to slap you around a little bit. And you can tell in that really simple, simple two sentences that, you know, Clark cares about his mission. And you get the feeling he's done this like countless times. You know, like this is going to be a routine like any other, yeah. you know, this guy, th as far as um, Clark's concerned, this guy's just some, some grunt, you know, some, some, just some no name air. Yeah, he doesn't initially know he's who significant he is. to just, all he knows is his call sign and that's about mm. it. He doesn't even know rank or anything like that. No. And then that, that brings, brings me into why I really think the movie works is, is because of that core chemistry between Hackman and Glover, which even though they only probably spend I don't know, probably, probably yeah, it's not minutes. even on it's not even in person chemistry no. it, their scenes were obviously filmed separately mm. and mm. yeah and you get and you only see them on screen together like in 10 minutes together right near the end i think 10 15 minutes it's probably longer um but i think this i don't really think works. it is i think it is, is the it last 10, 10 minutes so yeah but all those scenes in in the early stages where hackman's moving to one place to another place you're giving the golf references which is something that did happen Mm -hmm. um so in case the radio was picked up then they the the north vietnamese wiretappers would have no idea what they were talking about um you know the thing about the swanee that's a real thing um that did happen so i just really enjoy that the building of the relationship between the two men is is really strong and powerful and that's it's my favorite scene is that early bit where they're creating their relationship I, I really enjoy it yeah good choice um Mine is is uh, Danny basically learning to fly a helicopter. That is funny. That's a funny scene. Um, yeah, there's a few nice scenes of, of on the ground. There's a few uh, interesting scenes between the, um, the the squadron mates. Yeah, Danny chatting around the poker table, um, and the the, uh, the 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 Jolly Green um, pilot. They build the relationship between the two of them, you know, the mutual respect element mm. of that really nicely. Mm. So that his death does hit home. And yeah. that is, that's good scripting. That's good filmmaking. The way that they managed to do that without really laboring it. No, it's not laboring. It's, a, it's yeah. a bit of a hallmark of this film in that all the relationships are, uh, are created through good scripting 
good performances that aren't overly labored and, no. and there isn't a lot of pandering to the audience in that we need to set this up no um, it's not yeah and it, it doesn't really do that the, the scene i really liked uh i thought was that i thought was interesting was the scene on board the the b-52 that is is doing the um electronic um warfare with tracking the sam sites and stuff i thought that was really interesting um side yeah. of things that you don't see very often i love um, the model work on that yeah pretty good wasn't it's it it's fine yeah but i yeah. kind of love it looks it's very definitely, 50s definitely a when, tv movie vibe yeah, to it when it? one of the when one of the sam, sam missiles comes up and the plane like does this really jerky movement to get out of the way of it it reminded yeah. me of thunderbirds it was like yeah, really yeah. quite it, cute and twee like if you compare it to strategic air command which we did on, on the show a few months yeah, well, true, actually. a while back yeah. now it's definitely not even in the same league as that but it was okay it's it's fine and it's only on screen for like what 30 seconds not even that's that. why they haven't thrown a lot of money into it no no yeah yeah no i love it it's great and yeah and maybe with that we should we should mosey on into final thoughts like we always do um so as you know as we've been saying all along it's a very straightforward like proper no frills no strings attached war film there's no b plot there's no c plot you know, you learn very little about these men, really. Uh, and you don't really learn anything about the grander scheme of the war. There's, it doesn't do what a lot of Vietnam movies do of that era and since, where they get into the morality of it, the the whys, the hows, the ifs, the buts. It's it's not about that. It's literally about getting Hackman out. And, and I think that's why it's so strong and why probably it's so beloved, because whether you're into war or not you can enjoy this movie because it's a human story it's not trying to be like well the americans shouldn't be in vietnam blah 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 imperialism yada yada it's not about that it's just two guys doing their essentially doing their jobs and tr trying to help someone escape a dangerous situation yeah um because it reminded me how like other nam films take quite a long time to get into their plot so like to, to not pick on it because I do enjoy it, but We Were Soldiers takes an absolute age to get Ooh, to the, it does. That is very true. Yeah. To get to the battle. And you learn so much about these men. You have, as a viewer, you have a hell of a lot of skin in the game. And I understand why it needs to do that. But sometimes I think when you, you're going a bit hard here, I don't need to see them having a big party. I don't need to know about every little detail of everyone. And, and this movie doesn't do it. And I think it's all the better for it. Uh, but but then on the other hand, it's not as gritty and visceral as something like Rescue Dawn in 2006 is. Um, and that's a PAL movie and it's an escape film. It's, com it's a completely different kind of movie, but it's got an airman in there being shot down. Um, yeah. But a, they're, diff yeah. they're different Bleak. sides of the same coin, really. Um, but... Yeah, I just think it all works. I mean, I know I can tell now why the Patreons and the listeners have been wanting us to cover this one for a while because it was just a just a really nice film to watch. Like this, I can't really pick anything out that I don't like, but I, I have one thing, and I will in a minute. But I'm going to let you go, and then I'll jump in with something negative. I I would disagree that there's no moral element to it because I think the, okay. the anti-war streak that we mentioned a little bit earlier is probably that element to it. It just doesn't do it in a ham-fisted way or right. I didn't the pick way up that, on it as much. I didn't pick up on it as the much way as that you, some films did, and it it doesn't try and be very philosophical with it the way other films did. Um, right. It's it it's a very human reaction. Um, that I think that Hackman carries off quite well, um, because he's he's shocked because he initially he's he's gung ho. He wants to call in an airstrike on the on the crossroads, and he he, mm. he, he acts as a forward um, observer. Um, but once he sees um, the 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 effect of the the um, the napalm. On, yeah, on of the course. actual yeah, crossroads, no, you are, you are the, right. there's wounded you are. Uh, MVA and uh, one's part of his misery, and he's looking out through his little monocle, and he, he's you know kind of shocked through his eyes. Yeah. yeah, no, I get where you're going with it. Yeah, um, and then later there's the unfortunate incident with the uh, the Vietnamese farmer, um, who's kind of stumbles onto him while he's mooching around eating some rice in his hut, his mm. workshop basically. Um, 
I think if if Gene had put down the the little box that he'd probably spent like six weeks carving, yeah, the, there wouldn't have been the fight that that ensued. Maybe not. And, Maybe not. And I like the 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 part where um he tells uh, Clark that he killed a man today. And mm. Clark has no point of reference for that, and he just says, "Roger that." Doesn't really comment mm. on it back because they're both Air Force officers and they're both flyers. They've never engaged with conflict and the actual human impacts of war on the ground. So this is the first time for Hamilton to actually encounter suffering from the acts and yeah, I'm with missions you that the Air Force is, is take, undertaking. Mm. Clark has no point of reference for that. No point of reference for actually hand to hand close quarters no. you know, death. Yeah. So, and you know, I mentioned earlier the 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 young lad with the burn, um, and then the the part where the jelly green, um, is forced to land and its its pilot is shot, which really affects Danny's character. But at the same time, you get that feeling of intense guilt, um, from Gene because he says, "I'm just going to hand myself in. I'm just going to surrender." Um, and and Glover has to explain like, even if they get you, they're not gonna, they're, they're not gonna let that crew live. You're not getting um, out. Yeah, yeah. So I I really liked the nuance of that, and I thought, okay, it could have been a, a even more straightforward movie where it's, it is just point A to point B, him getting out. It's a survival story, but there's a there's a little element of that that I that I thought was mm. good. I thought the pacing was great. I thought it was beautifully shot. Some of those pre-dawn sequences of the landscape where the sun's coming up and yeah, he's moving over the crests, yeah. really nicely done. Yeah. There's some imp- impressive aerial stuff too, where that the the um, the Cessna is flying over the Jolly Green. Uh, yeah, there's some great in and out of the Huey, yeah. um, where they're zipping past the the village. Um, the end obviously doesn't depict the the actual accurate rescue. Um, no, it's over a bit quick. I think the end. It yeah, is it's it, one it, of my it, few issues. I I would agree there, but at the time, the documents and release, the story wasn't no. fully publicly told. Um, Norris did win that Medal of Honor, of course. He did um, yeah. All in all, I enjoyed it. It's no Firebase Gloria for me. I love that <laughs> film. It, it's got that. You're looking at like B tier Nam films, are you? Yeah, yeah. But it's good. It's really good. It's and no I love, I love Danny which Glover. I absolutely loved. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love Danny Glover. I love Gene Hackman, and they're both great in it. So it's it's a really solid, good picture. Yeah, yeah. So my only, and I wholeheartedly, I'm with you there. I did enjoy it. My only issue, and it's a very slim issue, really. Um, as I say, I think the ending is wound up a bit quick. I personally might have ended it a little bit differently, because mm. um, I was doing rivet counting. But on all, all the sort of after the credits were rolling, I was like. But that, but, but that boat could just be shot up in the next five minutes, like. You know. yeah, and it looked nothing like a US patrol boat either. No, it didn't look like a PBR at all. Um, I think they tried to make it look like I can't remember the exact names, but there were these bigger mm. assault craft that that could that could be used, and I think it was meant to be one of those. I can't remember the exact name. Um, I should know because I wrote a blooming article about them. Anyway, um, but my one of my issues is. And it, it leans back into Robbie's the just history. published a really great video on his YouTube channel about um, hovercraft in Vietnam, actually. Oh, yeah, I have. Yeah. Please go and watch that, just guys. throwing that plug in there. Pump it up. If you're still Our listening. military history on YouTube. Go and find it. Please, please like and subscribe. My children need to eat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so it, as I say, my issue is, it, and it's a small issue, it harkens into the real history. So Hamilton was in the jungle, you know, for, for 12 days. Um, and it, it doesn't and, feel like twelve days. In no, the film. it doesn't feel like twelve days in the film. Um, and I know it's, it's obviously it's adapted from. Um, he, you know, he never feels fully safe. There is a bit of cat and mouse in there, but the real mm. Hamilton hadn't eaten um, for days and was delirious. I think he'd only eaten some, uh, like some corn husks or something. I read, um, and he lost like forty pounds when he was found by mm. Norris, and he was absolutely delirious. You know, he couldn't really couldn't really understand what he was saying. Um, and I wish the film had lent into that a little more. So you see the, the sequence where 
Hackman's walking out and he has that interaction with the boy and there's the punji trap yeah. and he has his little stick. I kind of wish that that sequence had just sort of gone into a montage of him getting a bit to more somewhere. Over the, the survival aspect. Of yeah, it. I kind of wish that had come in mm. after that, where you could have had him chatting to Clark and him going a bit delirious. You know, maybe just rattling off like golfing scores or something, just to show that the mm. mental break had maybe set in. Um, but I kind of he just looks as sprightly as he did when he landed. There's a bit he has the stick and then yeah. the helicopter gets blown up and they run away and he's fine. <laughs> like he can run. There's no mm. there's no issue. But I'm really grasping for something this week, really. I wish they'd done that a little bit more. In Rescue Dawn, you definitely see the physical and mental uh you know breakdown of Christian Bell's character in that one. That one leans into it more. Um, which we'll have to do Rescue Dawn actually um yeah. at some point. It's a very good film. Um but no I'll echo Matt. Other than that, it's lean, it's an hour and forty. You can watch it in an evening, have a beer. You're not gonna come away like not enjoying it. I think it's one of the sort of unsung heroes of that norm genre kind of like how we say hamburger hill is like the perfect combat movie perhaps this is the perfect rescue movie who knows um i'm sure there are going to be red dawn lovers red dawn i'm sure they're going to be rescue dawn lovers and bat 21 haters who knows um yeah. but no a very well done enjoyable film um which i'm glad the patrons pick for us and you know if you want to join the fun um on the patrons please do you can support us for as little as two pounds 50 per month um which you know gets you a plethora of perks and, and whatnot so please go and have a look help keep the mics on at fof hq um and as always uh please do mosey on over to fightingonfield.com where you can find the entire back catalog of the podcast if you have if you're a new listener pick out some choice films you know come and join the fun on uh, x formerly known as twitter um and see us there and uh, as always, join us again next week for more raw movie reviews. And we'll catch you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.